In this module, we'll talk about properties of liquids. One of the, the first property is called surface tension, and this is the definition, how much energy it takes to increase the surface area by a unit area, by a square centimeter or something like that. Um, and the first thing to remember is that stronger intermolecular forces uh, mean higher surface tension. But let's, let's look at this a little bit more closely. If we were to look at a molecule on the surface of this liquid, it's, it has intermolecular forces on all sides of it and beneath it, but not above it, like this guy right here. But a molecule inside of the liquid will have intermolecular forces all around it. These intermolecular forces, it, let's say this is water, that's going to be hydrogen bonding. They lower the energy of this molecule because they're bringing opposite charges close to each other. That means that a molecule on the interior has a lower energy than the molecule on the surface which means that this liquid is going to try to minimize its surface area. And for a given volume, the minimum surface area is a sphere. So this is trying to be a sphere, but gravity is keeping it from doing that. Now, if we were to try to, if we were to, well, try and poke our finger through the surface of this liquid, we'd have to push these molecules of water apart. And to do that, we'd have to overcome the intermolecular forces. That's, that's the surface tension right there, um, how strongly that these molecules hold each other together, and, and how, much, you know, how, how, how hard it is, I guess, to, to push through them. And the kind of thing to remember is that increasing intermolecular forces mean higher surface tension. Viscosity is the next property, and it's a measure of a fluid's resistance to flow. So if you think about a liquid flowing, imagine you have a beaker of water and you're pouring, pouring it out. As the water flows over the lip of that beaker, if you imagine that water is thin sheets of water, each sheet being one molecule thick, then in order for the top sheet to flow, it has to move faster than the sheet beneath it, and so on. Which means that it has to pull against the attractions between the layers, the intermolecular forces. The stronger the intermolecular forces, the higher the viscosity. An example of something with pretty high viscosity would be maple syrup. It has a lot of hydrogen bonding, and that's it, it's thick, right? Which means that as you pour it, that, those sheets have a lot of intermolecular forces to overcome. Now, vapor pressure. To talk about this, let's imagine we have a container with a frozen liquid in it, like you know, ice, okay? And empty space here. We put, there's a vacuum. There's no gas here at all. And then we let this liquid melt. As it melts, what's going to happen is some of the molecules will escape from the liquid and go into the gas phase. And this will keep... And now, at first, there's not going to be many molecules up here, and they'll be just zooming around, doing the things gases do. But every once in a while, one might hit the surface of the liquid and be recaptured. But for the most part, at this point, more molecules will be escaping the liquid than will be returning. And that's going to keep on happening until you reach an equilibrium where the number of molecules escaping is equal to the number of returning. At that point, however many molecules on average are up here are what determine the pressure up here. That pressure, that's the vapor pressure of this liquid. Now, to understand this a little bit better, let's, let's look at the distribution of energy amongst the molecules. So these graphs here show how many molecules have a certain kinetic energy at one temperature here, T1, which is less than this temperature here, T2. We can see that this shaded area over here, let's say, is how many molecules have enough energy greater than the amount of energy needed to escape from the surface, E1. You can see here that there are fewer molecules in this colder liquid to have enough energy to escape than there are over here in the warmer liquid which means that there are going to be, at this equilibrium, at this colder temperature, there will be fewer molecules in the gas phase than there are at this higher temperature, showing that at the lower temperature, the vapor pressure of the liquid is lower than at the higher temperature. So increasing temperature means increasing vapor pressure. Remember that. Vapor pressure also depends on intermolecular forces. These three compounds here, well, diethyl ether and water. Diethyl ether has dipole-dipole forces. Water has hydrogen bonding. Stronger intermolecular forces here than here. Mercury is a metal, so it has much stronger forces holding the atoms together than either of these guys. And 
and look at this graph, vapor pressure versus temperature. We pick some temperature and look at the vapor pressure of water compared to diethyl ether. We can see that the vapor pressure of diethyl ether is higher at that temperature than it is for water. Weaker intermolecular forces mean higher vapor pressure. Stronger intermolecular forces mean lower vapor pressure at a given temperature. Remember that. Now, we can also look at boiling point. The boiling point of the liquid is the temperature at which the vapor pressure of that liquid is equal to the pressure above it. So let's say the vapor, the pressure above the liquid is normal atmospheric pressure, one atmosphere. That'd be this line right here. We can see that the boiling point of diethyl ether, the temperature at which its vapor pressure is equal to one atmosphere, is 34.6 Celsius. And you know, water is 100, mercury is 357 Celsius. So what we can get from that is that boiling point increases with increasing strength of intermolecular forces. Stronger intermolecular forces, higher boiling point, and vice versa. Now we have a clausius clapeyron equation. The useful equation relates the vapor pressure of a liquid to at a certain temperature to its heat of vaporization. So this form right here of the clausius clapeyron equation is the equation of a straight line, y equals m x plus b, where y would be the natural log of the vapor pressure, the slope of the line, m, would be negative delta h of vaporization over r. r is 8.314 joules per kelvin mole, one in the forms of the gas constant, times 1 over t, which is x. t has to be in kelvin, and the y-intercept would be the, some constant. So if we were to plot natural log of the vapor pressure of a liquid versus 1 over that temp its temperature in kelvin, and get the equation of the best fit straight line, the slope of that line would be equal to negative heat of vaporization over r. Remember, delta H of vaporization is just the change in enthalpy for the process of going from a liquid to a gas. We're assuming that this stays constant over the, the temperatures. And so the slope would be this. We could just multiply the slope by negative R, and we would get the heat of vaporization. Useful thing to know. Another useful form of this equation, clausius clapeyron equation, is this. If we were to take the vapor pressure at two different temperatures, P1 would be the vapor pressure at temperature 1, P2 would be the pr vapor pressure at temperature 2, and subtract the clausius clapeyron equation for P2 from P1. It looks like this. Natural log of P1 over P2 equals delta H of vaporization over R times 1 over T2 minus 1 over T1. What this lets us do is we can do, for it, one of the things we can do is if we know the vapor pressure at one temperature, we can find the vapor pressure at a second temperature. Don't get these mixed up. It's P1 over P2, and it's 1 over T2 minus 1 over T1. Um, if we know, also, if we knew the vapor pressure at two different temperatures, we can find the heat of vaporization. So memorize the clausius clapeyron equation or put it on your card. So here's an example. So given the heat of vaporization for ethanol, 39.3 kilojoules per mole, and the vapor pressure at this temperature, which is 100 millimeters of mercury at 34.9 degrees Celsius, What's the vapor pressure at another temperature, say 47.3 degrees Celsius? Well, we're going to use the clausius clapeyron equation. Um, make sure you keep your 1s and your 2s straight. 1, let's call 1 P1, which is 100 millimeters of mercury, and T1, 34.9 Celsius. So what we're going to do is plug into the clausius clapeyron equation. What I did here is I'm going to plug into the right-hand side here. Notice, okay, because R is 8.314 joules per Kelvin mole, the heat of vaporization has to be in joules per mole, and you're almost always given it in kilojoules, so watch out for that. All I did was I replaced the kilo with times 10 to the third, so 39.3 times 10 to the third joules per mole over that, and make sure, you guys, that you put the temperatures into Kelvin. This is 47.3 in Kelvin, 34.9 in Kelvin. So plug those guys in, and we get some number, negative 0.5937, or 0.95, negative 0.594. That's this whole right-hand side. That's equal to natural log of P1 over P2. All we do now is take E to both sides. So E is the inverse of the natural log. So we get P1 over P2 equals E to the negative 0.594. And that number, if you put it in your calculator, is 0.552 or so. So rearranging this a little bit, multiplying through by P2 divided by 0.552, we get P2 is equal to this, plugging in P1. And we find that P2 is 181 millimeters of mercury. And you should always check and make sure it makes sense, right? Because 
we know that vapor pressure increases with temperature be and because T2 is bigger than T1, we should get P2 bigger than P1, and it was.